I am going to begin by doing the most unpopular and unwelcome thing, not to mention the most cliched thing for an American speaking in London to a primarily British audience. I'm going to quote Winston Churchill. Speaking to the Conservative Members Committee on Foreign Affairs in March 1936, a time when he was well out of power and almost despised by party leadership, perhaps not quite as despised as he is today, though strolling around in Westminster yesterday, I noticed happily that his statue is still there and that it's been cleaned up. I recall the pictures of its defacement from 2020. I was pleased to see that. Anyway, Sir Winston said the following. For 400 years, the foreign policy of England has been to oppose the strongest, most aggressive, most dominating power on the continent, and particularly to prevent the low countries falling into the hands of such a power. Viewed in the light of history, these four centuries of consistent purpose amid so many changes of names and facts, of circumstances and conditions, must rank as one of the most remarkable episodes which the records of any race, nation, state, or people can show. Moreover, on all occasions, England took the more difficult course. Mr. Churchill then gave several examples from Philip II of Spain to Wilhelm II of Germany of England avoiding the easy way in favor of the harder. Now, I teach a course called Grand Strategy. The title was not my choice, it was assigned to me. Uh, and every time I repeat it, the title that is, I recall George Kennan's admonition to a subordinate who used the phrase in a memo. Kennan scrawled in the margins, drop the word grand. What does grand strategy mean anyway? It's hard enough just to define strategy. Uh, for a, a, about a year, I worked for H.R. McMaster, General McMaster, when he was the National Security Advisor. And in the National Security Advisor's office in the White House, there's a big bookshelf and uh, with a lot of books. And I swear to God, half the titles on those shelves had the word strategy in them. It took, you know, 250 books just to define the word. And we're still, it's like a platonic dialogue. What is justice? You never, you never get to the end and figure out what it is. But I have to teach grand strategy, which means I have to have a definition. And when I was thinking of a definition, uh, it, it came to me from recalling that paragraph that I just read to you, which I first read in college around 1990. So I define grand strategy as a policy or approach to international affairs that remains constant over centuries, that survives changes of government or party, of monarch, and even of regime. For instance, the grand strategy of the United States since the founding has been in part for America to utilize its unparalleled situation away from other great powers to pursue its internal development to ensure that no hostile power gains any kind of foothold in the Western Hemisphere, and to maintain a strong navy to protect its shores, ports, and seaborne commerce. Now, we may say that this strategy necessarily underwent some change or expansion in the mid-20th century, but those basic elements have remained remarkably consistent. Uh, changes in monarch are, of course, not relevant to us, although given recent events, they may be relevant to you. As for changes in regime, I leave to others to say whether either your country or mine have undergone any lately. Um, I gather free speech is protected here about as well as it is in the United States, and I don't want to get my hosts into trouble. So let's instead turn to a country that it's absolutely safe to criticize, Russia. The grand strategy of Russia, at least since Peter the Great, if not well before, has been to secure its porous and in some cases all but indefensible frontiers by pushing outward away from Russia's population hubs and economic centers of gravity via military means, but via other means more subtle as well. And that strategy has survived not only changes in czars, nor only changes in governments or even regimes, but from one radically different regime to another, from royalist, theocratic, agrarian authoritarianism to enlightened despotism to reformist czarism to hardline communism to reformist communism to whatever Russia is today. That's grand strategy, consistency of purpose over centuries, despite dramatic changes in my definition. So think back to Churchill's definition of British strategy. To paint with a very broad brush, your country had to fend off the, the Spanish, then the French, then the Germans, and then the Russians. You've been adversarial or even sometimes at war with all of them, as well as allied with all of them at some time or another, all depending on the times and circumstances. So, what today is, quote, the strongest, most aggressive, most dominating power on the continent, unquote. Uh, many people here, many people in my country, many people in my political party would like to believe that it's Russia. Uh, to express any doubt on this point is to risk being called a Putin stooge, as I believe I have been called more than once, or worse. But I just 
throw this out there. Russia is now 15 months into a war of its own choosing with a much weaker power. By some accounts, it has lost nearly 200,000 men. So let's assume that real number is half that, okay? Even so, that's still about twice what it took the United States 10 years to lose in Vietnam. And Russia begins, obviously, with a much smaller population than even the United States in 1970 and a lower birth rate. In any case, a Russia that has difficulty reaching, much less crossing the Dnieper, I hope I pronounced that correctly, does not seem much like a threat to cross the channel. So who does that leave? Maybe the EU, you know? Um, it sounds kind of preposterous. How can a big bureaucracy be a, a threat in this sense? But there are more ways to dominate, exploit, bully, and enervate than military com conquest. But didn't Brexit solve that problem? Um, I, I almost hesitate to talk about this because you know, I'm a foreigner. Why, why do you care what I think about Brexit? I don't even care what I think about Brexit. I was actually annoyed and embarrassed at Barack Obama in whatever it was, the spring of 2020, 2016, when he came over here and said, you'll all go to the back of the queue. And I thought, even if you think that's the right policy, you should butt out, right? It's just not for you to say. So I apologize for him on, on behalf of the United States for that. Now, in my opinion, Brexit was the right call. I would have voted for it had I been a British citizen and lived here. And I can't stress enough how much it buoyed us Trump supporters in 2016, especially Many of us were um, somewhat lonely. <laughs> we didn't know Trump was going to win. Uh, all we knew is that our political party that nominated him, all the leadership hated him, and the media class hated him. And this seemed like a, a favorable wind blowing across the Atlantic in our direction. Um, and many of us also, Anglophiles like myself, were enthused to see, in our interpretation, Britain standing up for herself against the globalist Borg. Which brings me to what I consider to be the real threat, which is no less a threat to us in America than it is to you. A threat that may consume the entire West and even potentially the whole developed world. It's hard to specify what this thing is. Is it wokeism? Is it the media? Is it the administrative state? Is it the university, NGO, international busybody complex? I would say it's all of the above, broadly understood under the rubric of the regime a transnational regime or movement or web of peoples and institutions that seek to control both our countries, plus many besides, and that, if we are to be honest, already does to an extent. Now, it's tempting to want to think of foreign policy in the traditional way as threats from predatory, predatory empires or nation states, but that is not the threat we face today, not the main one. The threat we face now, it seems to me, is both external and internal. It is external in the sense that in decisive respects, it is alien to the Anglo-American tradition. This ideology was not born in our countries. It is alien to what is best about the Anglo-American tradition. It seeks to fundamentally transform us, to change us for the worse, to make us servile and contemptible. It is internal in that while not born here, it has taken root here and in America. It has captured our elites and institutions, and I'm sorry to say we are partly to blame because so far, at any rate, we failed to stop it. Okay. Now, this is a foreign policy session. I'm supposed to talk about foreign policy. My conscience is clear in a sense that I have I've talked about grand strategy, but it's also reasonable, even necessary to ask, as my late great teacher and friend Angelo Cotavilla, who died about two years ago now, asked, is it possible to have a consistent, coherent foreign policy in a divided country? in a weakened country, in a country really beset by pressing, seemingly insurmountable domestic problems. I'm not picking on Britain. I certainly don't intend to. My own country suffers from all the same problems in plenitude. One of the remarkable things of being here is whether in listening to the people talk in the sessions or in conversations, private conversations at dinners, people say, you know, they'll explain something going on in the UK, and it sounds exactly like what we're facing. You know, well, here's some terrible thing that is being badly handled, and various uh, people are uh, making it worse on purpose. And I think, well, that's not unique. We have the same thing here. You just change the names around a little bit. Or there, I should say. We suffer from all the same problems. We're in the same leaky lifeboat together, tossed about on the same stormy sea. But there's something, I think, I don't know, out of touch a little bit about countries under such stress at home wringing their hands over what to do about the Donbass and Crimea. Now, 
I'm aware I will be accused of not caring about Ukraine or whatever foreign crisis or potential crisis you might be thinking of. Um, but sometimes I wonder that these, I, I think these criticisms are made in the spirit, same spirit as complaints that mankind should not have gone to the moon or circumnavigate the globe or discover Drake's Bay until all diseases are cured and all poverty is ended. I mentioned Drake, that's for Sir Francis Drake, who set foot in my home state of California in 1579, only the second Westerner ever to see it. Uh, that state is now in dire shape, as is my entire beloved country. My fellow native Californian, Victor Davis Hansen, has observed that, quote, societies in decline fixate on impossible postmodern dreams as a way of disguising their inability to address permanent problems, unquote. I, s I have lately been wondering if the same is not true in foreign affairs, that countries that have trouble keeping the lights on, maintaining public order, protecting their borders, or to be more precise, that choose to do none of those things, instead go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, to borrow the famous phrase from John Quincy Adams. I would argue or submit that before our countries can again fruitfully look outward, before we can again be salutary busybodies on the world stage, or in politer terms, spreaders of universal values, we need to address these very pressing domestic problems. That means restoring what once, to borrow a phrase, what once made us great. Liberty, virtue, morality, decency, honor, respect, and strength. Uh, we're not there yet. I'm known as something of a pessimist, so I'll just say this line as written, to be blunt, we're not close. And we're sliding in the wrong direction. But the way out is clear. We must, by a supreme recovery of moral health and martial vigor, arise again and take our stand for freedom as in the olden time. Some of you may get the reference. That recovery, I would argue, must be our joint grand strategy. If a foreigner may deem to give you advice, England, or Churchill put it in another context, quoting someone else, he ought to have said Britain, of course. I suppose I ought to say the United Kingdom, of course. Must once again choose the more difficult course. So must the United States. So must the entire West. There is no other way. It will be hard, but it is necessary. And there is glory in it, glory in the attempt and greater glory in the victory. Thank you.